I have distinct childhood memories of my grandpa sitting on his recliner in sweatpants and a white t-shirt doing a crossword puzzle. He told me they kept his mind sharp. Now, he wasn't wrong. Multiple studies have shown improved cognition and less brain shrinkage with regular crossword practice. However, you can't just sit around doing crossword puzzles and expect a miracle when it comes to brain health. The foods we eat have a direct impact on cognitive function throughout our lives. I'm Colleen, a PA, dietitian, and your nutrition mentor. Welcome to the Exam Room Nutrition Podcast, your guide to giving better nutrition advice. Quick reminder that I have a free weekly newsletter where I share useful nutrition strategies and resources that will make you look like an absolute nutrition genius. You can sign up for free at examroomnutrition.com slash sign up. Now, did your grandparents do crosswords too? Well, this episode isn't just about memory exercises. We're unpacking a well-researched dietary pattern that when followed may reduce the risk of Alzheimer's disease by up to 53%. It combines the best of the Mediterranean diet and the DASH diet, and not only will improve your patient's blood pressure, diabetes, cholesterol, and risk of stroke, but also improve their brain function and prevent age-related cognitive decline. Now, according to the World Health Organization, dementia is the seventh leading cause of death globally. While genetics and other risk factors do play a role, research shows lifestyle factors, especially diet, can make a real difference. Now, in 2024, when achieving a certain body size is all the rage, brain health often takes the back burner when it comes to health. But ultimately, we all want to live a long, healthy life and nourishing our brains is the best way to do so. So my guest today is going to unpack the MIND diet and share practical ways we can encourage our patients to fuel their brain. Now, two of her tips are hands down the smartest ways I've ever heard to help our patients eat more fruits and veggies. Maggie Moon is a best-selling author of The MIND Diet, a scientific approach to enhancing brain function and helping prevent Alzheimer's and dementia. She is a Columbia University-educated, culinary school-trained registered dietitian with clinical training from top-ranked New York Presbyterian Hospital of Columbia and Cornell Universities. She consults for government agencies, national nonprofits, global brands, and serves on multiple expert advisory boards. Now, if you've ever wondered, how to help patients prevent cognitive decline, or if you're interested in the latest evidence on diet's influence on brain function, this episode is for you. By the end, you'll have actionable strategies to bring into your practice that can help your patients improve their brain health at every age. All right, let's get started. Well, hey there, Maggie. Thank you so much for being here. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Colleen. I'm so happy to be here. I'm so excited to get into this topic because like we were talking about off air, it's surprising that not a lot of people know what the MIND diet is. So I would love if you could give us an overview of what exactly is the MIND diet and then maybe how does it differ from other well-known diets like the Mediterranean or the DASH diet? The first thing that I want to share is the reason you see MIND diet in all capital letters is because it is an acronym. So that first letter is a doozy. So the first letter M stands for Mediterranean Dietary Approaches to Stop Hypertension. In essence, that's the whole M. So that's M and then Intervention for Neurodegenerative Delay. So Mediterranean Dash Intervention for Neurodegenerative Delay. That's the whole acronym MIND. I'm going to leave it there. We're just going to call it MIND from now on. And the idea is that it is also good for the mind. It is a brain healthy diet and that's how it was designed. And the reason it has Mediterranean and DASH in the name is because it actually combines elements from two of those very well established, very well studied, heart healthy diets. And then it's been optimized with specific foods and patterns that the research suggests is going to be supportive of brain health. And so that's why you see a few differences. And so overall, what are the differences? This is the top question that I get. The difference is that it really is simpler. There are you know, fewer servings of fruit, just a specific recommendation on berries, fewer servings of seafood, which is often a challenge for people to meet the two plus a week, which is great. So it's just simpler overall. It's also so broad that it can be applied to different preferences, restrictions, allergies, as well as cultural heritage. Such a helpful overview. And 
I personally love acronyms. However, I think the letters for the M is kind of confusing. So I think they could have done a little bit better. But I really do like that it stands for mind and it is really all about cognitive function and improvement. And so let's dig a little bit deeper into really the main components of the mind diet because there are some guidelines that we can educate our patients about. Right. So there are 10 guidelines, but even 10 to me sounds like a lot. So I like to break it down into what does that mean for the week of eating? So every single day, we're going to be having a serving of leafy greens and at least one other vegetable. And at least is kind of a key word there. These are minimums, right? You're also going to be eating whole grains every day. And the main fat you're going to be using is going to be olive oil. So that's daily. And that's already four out of the 10 foods. And then about five times a week. So you can think about that as your work week. You're going to be eating nuts. So I like to think of that as why don't you snack on nuts and then incorporate it other other places as well. And then about every other day, it works out to about three to four times a week, you're going to try to incorporate beans. And again, these are minimums. And then twice a week is when you're going to enjoy lean poultry as well as berries. And then once a week, there is a recommendation for seafood. The other recommendation that I'm leaving for last is a daily five ounce clash of wine, typically a red wine, but it is 100% optional, especially since we've seen some of the newer science come out about, about drinking alcohol. Okay. I love how it's pretty simple. Like it sounds like it's pretty simplified. And I do really like how it looks at the diet in total throughout a week, because I feel as though people can get really hung up on like, oh my gosh, I didn't have my fruit today. And they think that the whole week is ruined when science has been proving over and over that it's really looking at like, what are you eating in total? What is your overall diet looking like? So I love that it kind of gives you hope for the next day. If you really, you know, if you didn't have any fruit that day, hey, tomorrow's a new day and it's perfectly fine to really focus on your fruit the next day. So I love how simple that is. Colleen, I think you're so right about the overall diet pattern helping and not feeling like you failed because you haven't met a recommendation on a single day because the results actually show that if you follow the MIND diet, you can reduce your risk of Alzheimer's by up to 53%. So you can cut your risk in half potentially. And then you're also going to be able to slow down your brain aging by up to seven and a half years. And some of these benefits hold true even if you follow the guidelines even moderately. So even moderately, you're going to see up to a 35% risk reduction in Alzheimer's. So that tells me that you don't have to be perfect, but if you can make progress, you're still going to get some benefit out of it. Seven and a half years, that's huge. You know, that's almost putting on a full decade to your life. So I love that. And I really like how it's doable and it's encouraging too, because, you know, we are in the day and age of like, everything is toxic. You can't have this, you can't have that. And God forbid you have a bowl of Fruit Loops, you're going to like turn <laughs> into red dye number 40 overnight. You know, I really like how this is very practical and it's like even small changes really, really do add up. And when you look at it in a week, it's not that hard to eat that much beans or that many berries when you spread it out over a week. All right. So we've talked about what foods are included. Now, what foods or maybe ingredients are limited or altogether avoided in the MIND diet? And then can you explain why that would be? Yes. So first of all, there's no foods that are eliminated. They are just limited. So it's, again, all about that balance over your day, over your week, over your month, about the balance of more positive nutrients versus the negative ones that could be hurting your brain health. And so there are five types of food that have been identified in the MIND diet that we want to limit. And the reason is that we're trying to reduce saturated and trans fat load as well as added sugars. And so the five groups are red meat, full fat cheese, solid fats, including you know coconut oil and, and butter, pastries and sweets, as well as fried fast food. And I just want to share that your listeners might be interested in that the way this diet was originally created was based on a United States food frequency questionnaire. So these are the foods that are going to be contributing the most to these food groups. And that's why they were in particular chosen. But we're clinicians, so we we can use our common sense. So if we're working with a patient and there's a food that is a little high in saturated fat or added sugar and it's not on this list, we know enough to guide them to reduce those as well. I love that you pointed out that the guidelines say limit, not eliminate, because that is a big one. And that is a really difficult piece of change and making healthier choices for patients when they go on these like hard and fast rules and complete avoidance, because we know that restriction leads to binge eating and obsession. And so I, I love that that's the key word is that, hey, let's try to 
limit or reduce and as opposed to just you can never have any pastries or sweets ever again. <laughs> no one wants to hear that. So I really like that you made that distinction there. Okay, so you mentioned that the MIND diet helps with Alzheimer's and cognitive function, but I'm curious as to what patient populations might benefit from following this diet. Well, Colleen, most of the research is in anywhere from the middle age to the older adult, because that's where we can see some of the benefit. But, you know, since the first two landmark studies on the MIND diet came out in the fall of 2015, there have been over 150 papers that I've reviewed since then. There have been even more, I'm sure. But last I cut off my lit search, it was 150. And they cover all age ranges and several different conditions. And because the MIND diet is based on Mediterranean DASH, we know it can be safe and healthy really for any age group, young, old, pregnant. So it's really appropriate for anybody and will support brain health at any age. But when people ask me, when is the critical time for this to make sure that these habits are, are cemented and, and developed. It's really in middle life, midlife, in our 40s. We know from recent CDC information that one in nine adults over 45 actually complains about subjective cognitive decline, which is the worsening of memory over the last 12 months. It's a self-reported thing. But what it tells me is that we, we're not waiting for it a diagnosis in our 60s and beyond when our you know our risk increases so much of cognitive decline but even earlier t- decades earlier we're st- we're noticing these small changes and i think that's a great wake up call for people to start paying attention to how to live and feed their bodies to nourish their brain i think it's never too early and it's also never too late to really make improvements on your health and on the foods that we choose to fuel our bodies with so if you work with patients elderly patients now is the time to start. If you're working with people in their 20s and 30s, why not start now? You know, there's there's nothing I would say new about the foods that we're recommending. Dietitians have been shouting from the rooftops, eat more fruits, eat more vegetables, eat more beans for decades. But this is just a, a different package. And I think that the studies are really showing that this combination of eating is really, really critical. So I would suggest this for any any age population of patient. And I think that they'll see health benefits regardless if they're worried about their memory or cognitive health. And that's what I wanted to ask you. Are there other medical conditions that the MIND diet would be helpful for? Well, because it is based on heart-healthy diets, anything having to do with cardiometabolic health, you'll see a benefit. So an easy way to think about it is anything where you would have recommended a Mediterranean or a DASH diet is likely to benefit. So cardiovascular health, diabetes, these conditions will be supported by this eating pattern as well. I love that about this dietary pattern as well, because when you have a patient, and reality is a lot of our patients in the adult population do have obesity, they do have diabetes, they do have high blood pressure, they probably have fatty liver. You don't have to manage these four conditions differently with a different, quote, diet. This meal pattern can work for all of those, and it would prove beneficial and improve those markers to all of them. So I really like that it simplifies our work as providers of like, hey, let's just talk about this one dietary pattern because guess what? It's going to improve all of these other medical conditions that you have. And so I really like that that makes it really, really simple. Yeah. And, you know, people are really motivated about preserving their cognitive health. So if that's the way in, there are all these happy side effects, like you said, better heart health, better overall health, even better mental health. There's been some research on the mind diet and mental health as well, which, you know, you're not surprised to hear once you learn about it being nourishing for the brain. It's the same organ. So, you know, the other thing, Colleen, that you made me think of when we we're talking about the all ages and, and life stages that the mind diet would be good for is that, you know, there, there really is this continuum of how the brain is developing from in utero all the way into older adulthood. And it's not static stages. It's not, you know, synaptic development, pruning, and then loss. It's really constantly these, these processes that the brain is, is undergoing are overlapping throughout our entire lives. And all of that requires nutrients to support the literal structure of the brain, protecting it, repairing it throughout our whole lives. So whether we want to be sharp in the boardroom or we want to, you know, be a good student and a good learner to we want to preserve our memories and live independently later in life, nutrition is going to be a fundamental piece of that. 
There's some really cool data on a morning mixed berry smoothie improving mental performance for students. And there's also research on walnuts and reducing stress in a college exam situation. So, you know, I think parents want their children to be the best that they can be, and they want them to perform the best they can in school. And so there is that aspect as well that could be attractive to people. I love that you made that point, because when we talk brain health, sometimes we automatically focus on end of life and the cognitive decline that happens, but we aren't always focusing on the younger kids and that Food nourishes our brain no matter what stage that we're at. And I think Mm. that's really, really fascinating that this could help if you're sitting in front of a college-age student who's struggling with some anxiety or anything like that. So I really like Mm -hmm. that you brought that up. I'm curious if you know if there's any literature with the mind diet and ADHD or autism. Has there been anything studied in those two areas? So there's been interest, but what I will say is that we don't have enough to feel comfortable sharing beyond that. I think I clocked maybe 16 to 20 different topics that the mind diet has been studied in. Um, and I like to focus where the research has been um, the strongest. And some of these conditions that you're speaking to, there's interest, but there just isn't enough science there yet. So it's a space that I'm watching. Um, but right now we might have case studies. And the trend is positive. You know, I would say from a clinician's point of view, you can try it. It's just, I don't have like a huge body of literature to back it up. No, I think that's great. I love that nutrition science is always emerging and we're always learning new things. And I'm sure you'd agree with me, but I think it would be safe to say that for any person who is struggling with focus or mental sharpness, why not suggest they eat more fruits, vegetables, and beans? You know what I mean? Whether the literature is there yet or not, I think that it's going to be beneficial for their health overall anyways, right? <laughs> Correct. Absolutely. We're sometimes so caught up in, do I have the, the 10 RCTs? So yes, this is a generally healthy diet that will be supportive of brain health regardless of anything else. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I also really like how this diet focuses on nourishment as opposed to body image and weight because I feel as though as a society, we are very focused on weight loss and body composition. And we forget that we do need to eat for longevity and to promote health in the long term. And I really think that this dietary plan does that very, very well. Are there any studies that show that it helps with weight loss or weight management? So yes. And within the context of you know, moderating portions and guiding patients to that. So the clinical trial on the MIND diet from those June, July, I want to say last year that came out, did show a solid weight reduction that was maintained over the three-year study. So that was not the purpose, but it was, you know, it, it happens to be one of those happy side effects that for folks who would benefit from modest reduction in overweight that that is there. And that's largely because of the shifts that you're making in how you're eating. It's not a weight loss diet. That's not the purpose of it. But a lot of people, both in research and anecdotally, have told me that when they have made it, made changes to follow the MIND diet, they have found that they also just happen to, to lose some weight. I, I can't see how people wouldn't lose weight, especially if you are coming from following a traditional Western American diet of fast food and sweets, (laughs) that when you switch to whole foods, fruits, vegetables, poultry, fish, beans, you can't not lose weight, I feel. So that might be an added benefit. But again, I think as providers, I think this is a really helpful and important mindset shift that if that patient is eating, you know, two, three cups of beans a week, two to three cups of berries a week, that is going to help their life overall in the long term even if we don't see a six-week window of weight loss, because I think that's an important shift for society at large. So before we get into some specific tips about like exactly what we can tell our patients about how they can incorporate the MIND diet, I'm curious to hear what barriers or pushback patients have about this diet, and then what can clinicians offer patients to help them overcome that? So I love this question because, you know, as I was reading into this research and thinking about the foods that are 
it's such a broad range and you can apply to so many ways. I didn't see any barriers, but over the years, I have heard from readers and patients that they feel like they can't eat enough. They don't see how they can possibly nourish themselves with enough calories by following the guidelines. And that's why I mentioned earlier that all the foods that we want to eat more of, those are really minimums. So, you know, minimum two kinds of veggies a day. But if you want to eat more, 100%, you know, minimum seafood once a week. If you want to have more, so good for the heart, right? So that's one. And then you just, you let them know these are minimums and that the clinician can find ways to fill out the diet in other ways. The other thing is about how do we figure out foods that are not expressly recommended on the MIND diet specifically, because a lot of times when people are worried about brain health or some other health condition, the first thing is they just want to follow all the rules and they want to know exactly what to do. And they want you to give them, you know, a blueprint for life as a as kind of a security, but that's not real life. And so once they're over that initial diagnosis shock, um, they're going to want room to play and be less limited. So yes, there are these 10 food groups that are expressly re recommended, but then the clinician can help fill that in. So there are plenty of brain healthy foods. Now that we understand sort of why we're avoiding foods and why we're encouraging other foods, there are lots of other foods you can fill in like different spices, chocolate, cacao. That's always a fun one to tell people they can have more of different fruit. So even though the Mind Diet specifically recommends berries as a fruit to have every week, of course, there are benefits to having other fruit in the diet. Low fat dairy, such a good source of some minerals that we need, as well as you know, a lean protein and eggs, a great source of choline, which is so important for, for brain structure and health. So figuring out what to fill in. And then I would say that the other bucket of barrier is really unfamiliarity or just a struggle with, I don't think I can do that. I don't think I can keep seafood from going bad in my refrigerator. I don't think I can keep berries from going bad in my refrigerator. To which I would share that there are shelf-stable forms. We can look at frozen options. We can look at tinned and canned options as well. So we can problem solve. And just the last short note that I'll say on that is that I like to start with the individual that I'm speaking to. So I like to do patient-led care. So what what would work for them? Have them come to me with some some ideas about what would fit into their life and then if they're okay, I will suggest some ideas and still get their feedback on how would that fit into your life? Does that seem doable to you? I love that last point because I think that is so important. Although patients sometimes think they want a meal plan and <laughs> eat this, not that, it doesn't actually fit into real life. <laughs> so I love that you really have that patient-led care because I think that's a really important component when you are providing patient education is to really work with the patient in front of you, despite what the guidelines or the recommendations might say, you can tweak it a little bit because I feel as though if we can get our, our patients to eat more fruit, I don't care what fruit it is, let's encourage that. The other thing that I really love that you mentioned is that we're not really focusing on calories. And again, I think this is a mindset shift as well because so many people are like, well, how many calories can I have? How many grams of protein should I have? And this and correct me if I'm wrong, but this pattern doesn't really calorie count. Is that correct? That is 100% correct. And growing up in, a, in an immigrant Korean American household, no one's counting calories. We're all eating at the table. We're all eating tons of different foods all day long. We're all snacking on fruit. A lot of it is made from scratch. And, you know, it's about so many other things than calories. And so yeah, there is no focus on that and just really fits into sort of my philosophy around eating my whole life. I've never once in my life counted a calorie. Some people are probably like, oh my gosh, what? How do you know what you're eating? <laughs> but I think that also plays nicely into intuitive eating, which is another strategy that we can teach patients to like know when you're hungry, know when you're full. And that's a really helpful aspect of this. I think it kind of leads nicely into that added component of it. So now I wanted to get into a few simple tips that you can suggest for providers who are listening, who are maybe like, okay, I love this diet. I want to talk about it today in clinic with my patients and maybe they don't quite know where to start. So can you give us a few suggestions of ideas of how patients can incorporate more mind diet friendly foods into their daily meals? So I like to start with snacks. It doesn't disrupt, you know, your major meals and it's a great way to just add in some of these foods. You know, why don't we snack on 
nuts and berries. So I went to culinary school. And so I, I had this amazing flavor pairing of coffee, if you if you drink coffee, dark chocolate and walnuts as a morning snack. And it's the flavors just go so well together. So try something like that, something easy, veggies and bean dip in the afternoon, maybe when we are kind of creating more of that savory, crunchy snack, cut up some fruit to enjoy after meals. I, I mentioned I'm Korean. Every meal ends with cut fruit. I didn't even know what dessert was growing up. That That's just how we end our meals, cut fruit all the time, snacks, cut fruit all the time. So yeah, so I start with snacks. And then the next thing I do is when we want to level up, then we look for where do we put beans everywhere. Um, bean dips are very uh, easy. Soups and stews are kind of the next step. And if we get there, then I like to recommend how do we add leafy greens to everything? And the thing that I do myself, and I think is a great tip for folks, I, I buy those le- those pre-washed leafy green, those baby leafy greens in bulk, and I make it my mission to add it to everything that I can throughout the week to get through that giant box. So I will be adding a small handful to smoothies. I will be adding it underneath maybe like a pasta sauce. I will be adding it into like a, an egg scramble. I will be also making salads. That's sort of easy. And look, there's also real life. So if I've got a takeout meal that I'm reheating, I will reheat it and put it on top of a bed of greens so that by the time I'm done with that takeout, I have this wilted green yumminess that's that's soaked up the flavor from, from those leftovers. So where do we add leafy greens? Everywhere. So start with snacks and then look at how to increase beans and leafy greens. Those would be the starter tips. Oh my gosh, those were so good. I love that you start with snacks. I think that's a really interesting perspective and a really simple thing for patients to start with. Because again, it can feel very overwhelming when you go from eating traditional American foods, dining out all the time to like, oh, hey, you're going to have to follow a plant-based diet now. And it's like, where do I even start? I love that you (laughs) simplified it and started with snacks. And that's really, really doable because most Americans aren't really snacking. I would say, I think we're eating very large two to three meals a day, very calorie dense, very fat dense, very sugar laden. And so I find if you can just add in a snack that is really nutritious, that's a really, really helpful tip. And I think that large salad bag or container is brilliant Again, because it fits within the mind's diet recommendation of what you're eating over a week. So making that your goal. Hey, can you finish this whole bag of spinach each week? I love that. It also gives you that mental cue to be like, oh my goodness, it's Thursday and the bag is still closed. I haven't opened it at all. (laughs) Time to start eating, right? So those are really, really, really helpful. Brilliant tips, Maggie. Another thing that you did that I don't know if it's intentional but mm. I did not hear you say, stop eating this, don't eat that, stop eating that. You really started with what can we add into what they're already eating. And I love that philosophy. I love that strategy. Was that an intentional point that you are making? You know, it's interesting. It's it's sort of not intentional because it's just the way that I eat and the way that I think about food, but it is intentional because that is what I believe. So if if that's an okay way to explain it, but but yeah, of course we want to start with what to add. And I find that when we start to add good things into our life, whether it's onto our plate or just into our lifestyle, it leaves less room for the things that are not going to be serving us in terms of our overall health. And so I do want to acknowledge that making any kind of change is difficult and does require some effort at first. But, you know, that's why it's so important to make these into habits so that they then just become part of life and you're not noticing them and you're not going to an effort. It's part of your life. Because if we have to go to a great effort to do anything, we're we're not going to do it. Very true. Well, I really love your approach to this. I think you make it so doable. You make it easy to fit into any lifestyle. And so you wrote a book about this. And I would love to hear about your book, where people can learn, learn more about it, and you, so where people can find you online and on social media. Sure. And thank you for that. So I have a new book. It's called The Mind Diet Second Edition. It provides really easy to understand updates on that last eight years of science that I shared. We've had you know, over 150 papers come out. I have all new recipes. I also have a pretty robust FAQ section with everything from the common questions I'm getting from readers to hot topics that I'm hearing from health professionals as well. And there are worksheets on how to assess 
your diet versus the mind diet, meal planning, shopping lists, guides to bring healthy foods, and all kinds of tips and more. And so people can learn more about the book at minddietmeals.com, or they can also follow me and connect with me at Mind Diet Meals. That's where I'm at on all the socials. Okay, Maggie, I have to say this conversation is so intriguing to me. I'm turning 37 this year, so I'm in that like window of like, I got to start focusing on my brain health a little bit more. And even though I'm a dietitian, I generally do eat healthy. I'm definitely picking up your book because the fact that there's like recipes and tips and FAQs and myths and all that, like it's going to be so, so helpful. So if you are interested at all in improving your cognition, preventing Alzheimer's, and just improving your overall health and longevity, go pick up this book. I promise you it is full of great, great tips and information. Maggie, I would love to have you back on to continue this conversation. But until then, thank you so much for the gift of your time. This has been such a joy talking with you. Oh, well, thank you, Colleen. I've enjoyed the conversation. Now it's time for my nutrition notes. Now, it's one thing to just learn about nutrition and medicine. It's another to put that knowledge into actionable steps for your patient. Each patient comes with their own unique medical history, food preferences, lifestyle, and little quirks that knowing how to guide them can be really tricky. When I was a new grad, I felt really overwhelmed with this. And one of my mentors once told me to identify my patient's personal risk factors for poor health and then tackle the biggest ones first. Do they need to lose weight, exercise more, eat a healthier diet, lower their blood sugar, lower their cholesterol levels? Tackle the most pressing issue first. And I love this advice, but often by improving one marker for health will improve the others as well. And that's what I love about the MIND diet. It helps so many things simultaneously. And like Maggie said, some patients will be a little frustrated at first with the lack of a quote meal plan from the MIND diet, but there are so many resources online. And so I wanted to give you a quick overview of the 10 foods that the MIND diet encourages. Number one is green leafy vegetables. They should aim for six or more servings per week, which includes kale, spinach, and other greens. All other vegetables are encouraged. They suggest to try to eat another vegetable in addition to the leafy green vegetables at least once per day. Number three is berries. Encourage your patients to eat them at least twice per week. Any berry like strawberries, blueberries, raspberries, and blackberries because of their antioxidant benefit. Number four is nuts. Encourage them to get five or more servings of nuts each week. Now, the MIND diet doesn't necessarily break down which type of nut to consume, but a variety is probably best. Number five is olive oil. They encourage using olive oil as your main cooking oil. Number six is whole grains, encouraging them to have at least three servings a day, which is about one slice of bread or half a cup of cooked grains. Remember, whole grains include things like oatmeal, quinoa, brown rice, whole wheat pasta, and 100% whole wheat bread. Number seven is fish. They encourage fish at least once per week and choosing fatty fish like salmon, sardines, trout, tuna, or mackerel because of their high amounts of omega-3 fatty acids. And like Maggie had said, if your patient likes fish and wants to consume more than once per week, that is perfectly fine. Number eight is beans. Encourage them to include beans in at least four meals per week. This includes all beans, lentils, and soybeans, so they can have a variety They don't just have to stick with rice and black beans, for example, every night. Number nine is poultry. Encourage them to eat chicken or turkey at least twice per week. And they do note that fried chicken is not encouraged on the MIND diet. And lastly, number 10, they encourage no more than one glass per day. Both red and white wine may benefit your brain, but the research is shifting a little bit here with alcohol. So if your patient does not currently drink alcohol, you do not need to encourage them to start. Achieving and maintaining health does not have to be impossible. So let's not make it overwhelming for our patients. And I hope that you enjoyed this breakdown of the mind diet. That's all I've got for you this week. Thanks for tuning in and listening to my podcast. If it was helpful, go ahead and grab the link and share it with a colleague. As always, let's continue to make our patients healthier one exam room at a time. I'll see you next time.